Thank you. We have found in other screenings there usually needs to be a little bit of a breather between finishing and jumping right into Q&A, but not us, we're gonna jump right in. <laughs> Thank you everyone. Um, I know we just clapped quite a bit, but I just have to pause and, and just say, um, can we just hear one more round of applause for Samantha? So we are thrilled for you to be here and to have gotten to see this film. Um, we're gonna do a few questions. I'm the questioner, she's the answerer for the most part. And, uh, and we're gonna turn it to the audience. So if you've got any questions, feel free to think about them and Cole will walk around with the mic. So um, I think the first question that pops into a lot of people's minds after we see this is, how the heck did you end up in Peru? Where were you guys? How did this all come together? Like, give us the backstory. It's a bit of a loaded question. Um, I first went down to Peru as an intern to a PhD student at the University of Washington, and I fell in love with this pristine rainforest called Las Piedras, which you guys got to see quite intimately tonight. And at first, it was all about research and, and camera trapping and trying to discover new things in this place where really no one had gone before and done research before. And um, everything kind of changed when we found Khan. And um, it wasn't the plan at the time, but we kind of embarked on this mission to reintroduce him to the wild ourselves because there weren't any other options for him. And so you kind of see that origin story. I mean, fast forward. So this film is made up of footage between the years of 2015 and 2019. Um, a lot of it was actually taken um, by members of our team, ourselves, before filmmakers ever got involved. Um, so we bought our own little Sony cam and we were documenting this, this reintroduction process. You know, we were really adamant that we didn't want Khan to end up in, in a zoo. And from our research and all of our contacts, that was really the only other option. And, so you kind of see this story of some people trying to figure it out in their home in the middle of nowhere. And, um, and yeah, fast forward to what Ojo Nueva is now is very different. But we met two filmmakers, Trevor and Melissa, who this is their first feature film. Um, really amazing, passionate people who just kind of heard about our project and learned that we had this archival footage of Khan and his story and how much we wanted his story to be shared with the world. And, um, and then Keanu came into the picture and they got to kind of live with us and follow it in real time. So I think I answered that maybe a quarter of your question. <laughs> perfect, perfect. <laughs> so you touched on this, bring us up to date. Um, OHA today does, you know, the organization covers a lot of conservation issues, some of which were touched on just briefly in the film, but a lot of which were not really covered in depth. Tell us, tell us all about OHA today and the, your current efforts and where you're going. Right, um, so the film team left in 2019 and there's so much that's happened since then. Um, having Keanu, Keanu being in the picture kind of inspired me to to look forward to the future of acquiring a little bit more forests. So since getting Keanu to now, we, we now own about 7,000 acres of pristine rainforest. And that was inspired by him, but it's for the future of all of our animals that we're looking to rewild and that we are currently rewilding. Um, so since the film, we have acquired this beautiful rainforest, still working alongside local communities, which you see a little bit in the film. Um, still doing amazing research across the board with our team. Um, but we've built, since then, the first carnivore specialized rehabilitation center in Peru. And it's been a real game changer. And we've been working at the national level since the pandemic. Pandemic time was really, um, there was the wildlife trade and trafficking increased greatly. And, you know, it was, it was kind of one of those decisions like we either jump in fully and take this on or or we don't and so 
everything you saw in the film tonight was pre actually having a rescue center. It's all what we call like temporary custody of animals where the government can kind of just drop them off one day at our house. So since then we have a fully operational rehabilitation center specialized mostly in carnivores, but we also accept other animals and um, all for the end goal of rewilding them and giving them a second chance. And you've gotten a couple of recent um, new additions to the, to the... Many. <laughs> yes, tell us a little bit about some of those. Yeah, so we currently have I want to say 15, it might be 16, wild cats in our care. Um, we primarily work with uh, ocelots and margays. So margay is a slightly smaller, more arboreal spotted cat. Um, but we got our first jaguar in August of this year, um, which is a first for us. Working with big cats is a little bit different in terms of the, uh, the protocols, especially for you know whether you enter the enclosure or not. <laughs> I'm currently the only one who still does that. Um, and then, you know, just with time, just like how much you learn about the process of rewilding and what it takes and what these animals truly need. I mean, you know, back then it was working out of a house with whatever we had, sometimes without the materials to even build enclosures. And nowadays we've got this center, this fully equipped veterinary center, three veterinarians on site, wildlife rehabilitation specialists from all over Latin America who are super passionate about this work. We've got enclosures that are fully integrated into the natural environment. So we've got, you know, margaves and these huge, beautiful enclosures that get to interact with both their predators and their prey. So they get to experience what it's like to have a rat enter their enclosure and and be able to to hunt and kill it. They also get to experience the fear of when an ocelot walks by or a jaguar or another predator. And it's instrumental in kind of creating those correct wild instincts, and it's all done without having a human present. And so I think over time, what we've learned is is to really focus on the infrastructure and what we can give them in terms of resources, and really just taking a step back and letting it happen. Um, and that's all about having this place that's integrated so remotely into the rainforest. Um, so yeah, we operate with a minimum to zero policy human contact now, and, and it's been working really, really well. We've had great success. We've released six cats since Keanu, so very happy about that. Yeah. So I'm sure, like me, a lot of us could not imagine having our lives documented up on the big screen. A lot of the challenges you lived through, we all just witnessed. There's also a lot of challenges that go on behind the scenes and even in just the process of making the film. Um, tell us a little bit about what's been most challenging about this. Yeah, I mean, you just touched on them all. <laughs> um, I think, yeah, so, so making the film in general, I mean, was from the beginning just this kind of really surreal process. I mean, you've got two filmmakers and two kind of subjects living in the same platform in the middle of nowhere, you get to know each other really well. Um, and yeah, along the way, I mean, sometimes things change. I think in the beginning, I was really focused on, I want this to be a story about Khan. And then Keanu came into the picture and, you know, you, you think about all the footage that they've gotten over these many years and what the final project is going to look like. And, and for me, you know, seeing the film for the first time, it was kind of like, why are there people in it so much? <laughs> um, like, why am I in it? Um, and I get, it, it makes sense, but I think it was really challenging from the perspective of really being so like invested in it being a film about conservation and some of the issues that we face on the ground and generating awareness and generating support. And, and it touches on those pieces, but they, they kind of like have a backseat to some other important issues, but I think for me that was the hardest part was kind of like coming around to the fact that this is for a larger audience to reach the most people as possible and that's wonderful because it makes more people connect to this place and connect to the cause hopefully um, but I think it was really challenging for me um, just based on what I'm you know passionate about um, and then yes opening up on a screen <laughs> Um, there's some things that you saw here. No, um, yeah, being that, you know, we were both, we jumped all in and we 
shared parts of ourselves that like sometimes you don't even share with the person that you're really close to and it just you know it happened that way i think it happens when you live remotely too and sometimes you just have a camera in the corner and, and you, you don't want to talk to your partner so sometimes you talk to the camera or and you know you capture these moments that are you know very different but meaningful um i mean it took me about a year to even to even open up to the film crew about like my what brought me to Peru and like my upbringing and you know I don't even think I talked about my my dad or anything from my childhood until um, I was like I have to go back home like my dad's in the hospital and I actually think this time he's not gonna make it and he actually passed away during this film when we were filming and it was just really you know it's a hard thing and to have people around all the time filming that can be can be difficult. I think amongst the challenges, um, you know, Har Harry is certainly a, a challenging individual, as we've seen in the in the film, and um, and I know a lot of people following the film have questions: How's Harry doing? Um, you know, Harry was at Tell Your Ride with us, and he, he has certainly been out there with with a number of the film screenings, um, and we think he's doing okay, right? We think so. Yeah. We hope so. We hope so. That's right. Um, shifting gears, I think there's um, there's also a lot of uh, pleasant surprises, maybe some upside that you hadn't thought about in doing the film, and certainly since it released or, or since it premiered in September, you've had a lot of engagement with people, getting to see it. What would have been some of those pleasant surprises for you? I think the biggest one, which I'm still coming around to getting used to, is you know, just, I feel like my whole life is kind of built up to this point of, of you know, I really want to have a platform where, you know, someone can can speak to some of these issues that are happening around the world. And, and you know, if this film is what gets me there, then, then I feel pleasantly about it. Um, it's definitely a great, you know, way for us to raise awareness and to have a voice for, for so many that don't. And I think that's the best, that's the best part of all this is being able to, to kind of share these experiences, share our work, generate, you know, awareness for the cause and everything, but, you know, to people that wouldn't have even been remotely aware of some of these things that are happening. Um, and yeah, also to kind of share that like emotional side of things is, is great. I, I think, if it impacts people in a positive way, if they can relate to it, if they can, you know, you know, heal a little bit just from like one of the things that they heard in the film, then I think that that's worth it. Cool, let's take some audience questions. <laughs> oh boy. Anyone ready? I'll give it to my sister, no. <laughs> if, any, if anyone has a question, please raise your hand. No pressure, no pressure. Um, so, Sam, I'm curious with, um, so growing up here and obviously with the hometown audience, um, I'd love to know kind of, did any element of growing up here seed your passion for wild, for the, for the wilderness around you? I'd love, love if you kind of talk about that a little bit. Yeah, sure. So, I don't know if everyone heard, but basically it, growing up on Bainbridge Island kind of seeded my passion for the wild and I would say definitely yes. Um, I was very fortunate, you know, to move between a couple houses on Bainbridge that were always somehow nestled deep into a forest. Um, had parents that were extremely passionate about animals and, and rescue. You know, my dad would bring home owls and, and ducks and things. Like one time he slid his truck sideways on the highway and brought home a duck with all her babies and we raised them in our attic and, <laughs> and, then, and then released them. And, so I think that those things, like, you know, you don't notice them at the time, but they definitely affect, you know, who, who you are and who you become. And living on, a, on an island like this and the kind of, like, community involved in it and everything, I think it, it kind of just forms, um, yeah, form, it's a part of you. And, and then in high school, I got to go on, um, the first, I think it was the first ever kind of abroad trip with um, uh, a couple, I think, I think Casey Taylor's here. Hi, Casey. Um, and Brad, at the time, Jason wasn't involved in those trips, but 
you know, being able to go to Africa, I think I remember it being huge. My parents were just like, okay, this has to happen. This is like Sam's passion in life. Like she has to go and see these animals. And, and so having that opportunity really just kind of opened everything to me. Like there is an entire other world out there and I, and I have to go and see it. Um, and definitely going to the Amazon was on, was the next step. Hey, so I was given a microphone. Hi, Sam. Sweet Sam here. Oh, boy. <laughs> so, so as a fellow cat biologist, um, yeah, having a film crew pick up on your project and follow you around, and then Amazon buys this film, and it's this huge, resounding success. Um, yeah, so I'm wondering to what extent um, the proceeds of this film, if you know and you may not know, how it can support a growing nonprofit like yours to continue doing the great work that you do? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons why I've been trying to take full advantage of um, going to a lot of the screenings that I can before release on Amazon Prime and just kind of, kind of being a part of the different film festivals and events, being able to go to Jackson Wild, which was heavily focused on conservation more so than, than film, but it was, it was awesome. Um, you know, we are basically trying to, 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 to kind of use this platform as much as possible to raise awareness for our cause. And, and, um, and, you know, Amazon's been really supportive of kind of getting us to these different places. And sometimes we'll show up and there'll be a brunch of like 10 people in the industry. I have no idea who they are, but they're important. <laughs> and yeah, things like that. I think, um, I think there's so much work to do still, and we're still working on different ways that, that this film can it can benefit Ojanueva specifically. Um, I'm, you know, it's kind of one of those things you have to keep keep going after every day. And so we've been working really hard on that, like how can we make this actually come back and benefit the cause behind the film? Because that it doesn't always happen. Um, a lot of films have big impact campaigns, and this one, it doesn't necessarily. And so we're trying to kind of make that happen in partnership with Amazon and, and the filmmakers and everyone involved as best we possibly can. Uh, hi Sam, my name is Jeremy. Um, I was wondering three simple things. What does it cost to add an acre to your uh, wildlife conservation preserve? And Compare 7,000 acres for us to some space on Bainbridge Island. How big is that? And then I'm just sort of curious, how long can you be here without getting itchy to return to Peru? Can I answer the third one first? Is that okay? Um, it's really hard for me to get away, especially these days. We have such a small team of people. I know I've mentioned earlier that we have this policy now of you know, very few people have actual interaction with the animals, and, and but we do take in cases. Sometimes, like, we get, like, um, like two cats a month, and some of them come in really young, and right now we've got, I think, six babies that are in the kind of quarantine areas of our veterinary center, and it's very hard for me to be away at any moment. Um, so I try to kind of limit it to a couple of weeks. Basically, like, think about, like, if you're leaving your, your dog at home, how long it takes for them to maybe forget you. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but you know they're wild animals, so it's less time. <laughs> um, no, I, I, I mean Peru is, is you know my my second home. As much as here feels like home, Peru is definitely my home, and um, I'm always dying to go back. I miss it within a week of being of being here. But um, in terms of the acreage, I think in hectares and meters now. I'm not. I'm no longer American. Um, but it's about a hundred dollars a hectare, which I guess a hectare is like two and something, two point two acres, something like that. Um, so it's actually not that bad. I bought my first ever private piece of land in 2015, which is the house that you see in this is um, like our first ever facility, and it's we don't actually live there anymore. Um, but that first 30 hectares, so about 75 acres, I bought for nine hundred dollars. Yeah. It's worth more now, but just put it out there. Yeah. Any others? A couple more. Uh, Alejandro here. Um, congratulations. This is a beautiful film. And I think they, I can see the passion and the focus on animals, but I think there's as important as much on mental health. Mm. 
So I'm curious from a research and science perspective, uh, what are the things that you you can share the most on your PhD about the animals, but also if you have uh, colleagues or others in the mental health science and psychologists that can also learn from all of these, how what you're doing with animals, but what animals are doing for humans? It's a great question. Um, I mean, that's kind of how this film came about. I mean, it's not super explicit, but essentially, you know, there are people who come to the Amazon and, or there are people who work with animals in general. And I think that you have to have a very specific passion and heart to, to be, to work with animals. And, you know, I, I have never met another conservationist, someone who lives in the field, who's in it, and who doesn't struggle with mental health. It's, you are exposed to all of the destruction firsthand. Um, you, I mean, with us, like working with animals as well, like you receive animals sometimes and, and, and they don't make it, you know, and it's, there's always that question of what could have been done, what can we do to make it so this doesn't happen again? And I think it's just so common for, for people to, to struggle. And, and unfortunately, there's not a lot of access in the places where we are to be able to, to speak to people. Um, I think, you know, I, I'm probably the only one who, who had a, a really valuable kind of therapist, someone who was helping me from abroad. Um, but unfortunately, it's just something that, like, you know, everyone kind of uses nature. And, you know, Harry had his relationship with, with the cats, which um, wasn't always, you know, extremely healthy for, for either one, but it's what helped him to get through some of the issues that he struggled with. And, and yeah, I think it's, it does kind of show, like, the healing power of, of being in a space like that. Um, but definitely something that's worth shining a light on. I think it's not really talked about how much people in conservation actually struggle with being in that type of work and limited resources and everything involved. So definitely a, another story to be told. I thought it was a beautiful movie. Um, I, I wondered if you could comment some more about your relationship with your dad and were you able to um, settle some of your internal issues prior to his death. I'm also, there was no real comment about your mother, um, and I'm sort of curious about her role and the absence of the film. It's a great question. Yeah, I think with a film that's only an hour and 40, you can only put so much in. <laughs> and I struggled with that as well. I was like, my mom's face kind of like shows in it once or twice. My mom is the superhero. She's in the crowd tonight. Um, the most you know supportive person of me and my work and you know powerhouse got my siblings and I yeah it's a it's a difficult thing for for me to to speak about but I think you know growing up so you know having um, having an alcoholic father who you know it, it was a very different childhood. At least I felt like you know, it was something I could never really speak about and that you know, I couldn't tell anyone. It was very like, kept within the family. I had, my dad was extremely charismatic and everyone on the outside loved him so much and I did too. And that was really hard for me because I think it was you know, growing up, you, you have these two people, but they're one person. And um, so I developed this like, ability to kind of see people and see them differently and, and notice the good in people, even if there was this like side of them that wasn't so good or didn't treat you so well. Um, and I mean, unfortunately, because I was living in Peru, you know, almost full time at that point, you know, my dad was in and out of the hospital and um, I didn't actually get to um, say goodbye to him before he left, I was able to make it here and you know, my mom and I were, were there, and my sister and my brother came, and it was the first time we'd all been together in a very long time. And um, my dad is a huge part of me and, and who I am. I feel like I have this like super compassionate side that's from my mom, and then this fire that's from my dad. And 
they're both very important parts of me who, who make me who I am, and I'm very grateful to both of them. But um, I think this film is very indicative of, you know, sometimes people can be in the forefront because they're very charismatic and because they tell a good story. But sometimes it's the people in the back who are doing a lot of work. And um, that's true in my family and in this film. Hi, my name is Shannon. I'm over here. <laughs> and um, thank you so much for sharing your story with us. I came expecting a story about an ocelot, and it's clear from what you've said so far that it was a personal journey to decide to embrace sharing the personal part of your story. So my question is about your process, to accept that it was worth sharing your authentic story to achieve your passion, to say yes to sharing the very personal story that helped shape the film. Yeah. To it was definitely a process, I would say, you know, it started with this story that was supposed to be a 20 minute documentary about Khan, and then that morphed into something else. And then along the way, it was just kind of like these pieces. And, and at one point in time, you kind of forget, you know, the stuff that's even on film um, or off film. So it's, I think the process itself and just like feeling at one point, like very comfortable with, with the people who were filming. So like these two filmmakers are, I mean, we've been through everything <laughs> together and we, we still get on the phone and fight and, but we're all, <laughs> we're all still really good friends at the end of the day. I think it was that relationship, you know, developing that and like living together and having that trust that at the end of the day, you know, what was shown was going to be real and it was going to impact people and it was going to be, you know, a story that was for the masses, but you know, had truth to it. and. And I think that at the end of the day, that's just kind of what I had to focus on is like, okay, this is the end goal. And, you know, there's a lot more that they could, they could have shown for sure. Um, so, so yeah, I think the outcome was, was not necessarily what I expected, but, um, but somewhere around there. Maybe one more from the audience, anyone? Or otherwise we can take it. Take it up here. Go to you. What about you, Steve? <laughs> what about um, any of the pleasant surprises from the film, or maybe even talking about how you got involved? Because I don't think, maybe some people know, but it would be interesting to share. Yeah, there were some pleasant surprises. I would say, you know, the first is, as you mentioned, when we first got the film going, and when I first got involved, it, it had, I would say, smaller ambitions, or at least certainly smaller expectations on my part. And I, I look at it now, and I, I get super excited about this, this platform and ability for you to serve as a role model, um, particularly as a father of two daughters. I think about um, a strong female scientist who can show that you can do courageous, sometimes crazy, ambitious things, and and it's uh, it's. You know, a, a bold path, and I and I think that that can be really exciting for young women to see and, and follow. So that that's a big pleasant surprise to me because it wasn't part of what I thought about with this with this film process. I think others are just sort of just you see the impact on people. When Sam and I were at the the first showing ever at Telluride that anyone besides us had seen the film, and I remember we walked out on the street afterwards, and this this sweet woman just came barreling up to Sam and just gave her a massive hug, just spontaneously, and just. Yeah, thanked her for sharing her story, and I think she had a lot of personal elements she related to, and just you can just see the impact you've had on people that have seen this film, and and I know I felt that myself, just being a process a part of it. And I think lastly, of course, just none of us could have expected sort of having Amazon come in and the distribution you can get and the and the breadth of exposure um, to tell the story. So that's been a that's been a big part of it. Um, and then lastly, I would just say, I mean, just for me getting involved, and a lot of my friends are here tonight, so they've, they've probably heard me go on about this, but I, I will tell a short story. It's probably five years ago, and a good friend, a mutual friend of ours, Brad Lewis, who's a, a high school teacher here, uh, introduced us, and he, he knew my wife and I were interested in supporting various nonprofit endeavors, and, and Sam and I had lunch with Brad, and 
I've met many people over the years, and particularly as an investor, you hear lots of CEOs pitching you their ideas, and every now and then, I'd say like maybe one out of a hundred, someone just stops you dead in your tracks, and you think they're gonna change the world. And at lunch at Plate and Pint, right on High School Road, um, I met someone who I felt was gonna change the world, and now I'm even more convinced how right I was. And so, Karen and I got involved to, uh, to be a supporter of OHA, and I've been on the board ever since, and that's how I got involved in the film when it first started, first started happening. Before it was cool, he was saying. <laughs> so as we wrap up, I just want to say it's been a thrill for me, and certainly my wife Karen, to be a longtime supporter of Sam and OHA, and if any of you have been moved by her story and this story and, and, and um, the things that she, she's doing, um, I would encourage you to find ways to engage and support. And I'm gonna offer you up a few of those. Um, the first is you can grab, grab this little fancy badge that hopefully you grabbed when you came in. And if you look on the back, um, there's this clever little QR code. And you can scan it anytime you want. Your phone will take you right to a little landing page that will tell you lots of great opportunities to donate. And, um, and so I would encourage you to check that out and, and, and do that when you get a chance. We also, on the way out, if, uh, if you're less, less QR savvy, there's some envelopes on the, on the piano you can grab. There's a pen inside and just write your name and any donation, big or small. I, I know it's very helpful to, to Sam and the team and you can just leave that right out there. We are now going to, I've got one little surprise, but we're gonna, we're gonna head across the street. I hope you'll join us. We've got lots of food. I bet everyone's hungry, lots of food. We've got more drinks, uh, lots of music, literally just straight across the street, up the stairs. You'll see all the lights, music will be going at the Manor House. And Sam and I would love to get to talk to everyone, meet everyone that we haven't met yet tonight and, um, and tell you more. There's gonna be all sorts of cool stuff from the jungle on some, a couple silent auctions. There's gonna be some nice videos some uh, some other donation stations, some t-shirts, some swag, uh, all sorts of cool stuff. But the cool thing, the really cool thing, um, hold this real quick. <laughs> this is Keanu. And this is a photograph taken by Trevor, Trevor Frost, our co-director, and he was also originally a National Geographic photographer. It's a beautiful color photo. And I would like you guys to, uh, to look under your seats because one very lucky special person has a Wildcat badge taped to the bottom of their chair. <laughs> Now, some of you are feeling like you wish you had won that, but you didn't. <laughs> so I'm going to give you four other chances, and they're going to go something like this. Between here and the manor house, where you'll have a better bandwidth, I guarantee you don't have the cell phone coverage right now. But on the way over there, there's open Wi-Fi upstairs. Just you know, pull this little thing out, give it a scan, and our top two donations by 9:30 tonight are going to win one color and one black and white Keanu, and then two others randomly picked. You don't have to be the top. All you got to do is donate anything. We'll also get picked. So we have four Keanu photographs uh, to be given out tonight, sometime to some lucky donors. So uh, give it a whirl. Use your phone. Give it a shot. And, uh, we will see you across the street. So um, I know we all want to chat, but the sooner we get over there, the sooner we can get to the food and stuff. So Sam and I will head right over. So thank you so much. Again, that will be at the Manor House upstairs, so please go up the stairs once you cross the street, not the marketplace. Thank you.